All right, today we're going to tackle the two-way ANOVA, and I'm going to do both the cell means and factor effects in the same lecture. So make sure you're ready for this. Obviously, you should have already conquered these in the one-way ANOVA setting. So make sure you can set up a cell means ANOVA uh, one way. And make sure you are perfectly comfortable with the factor effect style of the one-way ANOVA. And make sure you can construct any contrast you want with the one-way ANOVA. The con contrast construction will get more difficult as the models get more complicated. So it's best to make sure you're fully comfortable with the simple models before learning the more complicated models. So you would want to review either or both of the one-way ANOVA talks, the cell means or factor effects. So here's the setup. Um, the two-way ANOVA that I'm going to be focusing on today has two factors, A and B. A has three levels, so this could be two types of patient groups as well as a control group, and factor B could be gender, males and females. And we will start with the cell means. So if, you've, if you're already comfortable with the cell means and I tell you, okay, it's a two, two by three ANOVA, how many cells is that? And it's six, right? Two times three is six. So you have a patient group one, male, patient group one, female, so on and so forth. Six cell means. So in your head, picture your cell means model. If I set up my data like so, I have two groups, or sorry, two subjects within each cell in this illustration. Um, in real life, if you only had two subjects for each cell, that would be uh, really underpowered. So this is just for illustrative purposes. So here I have patient group one, say male, patient group one, female, and so on and so forth. Two subjects in each category. And hopefully this is the model you are picturing. So I just have an indicator variable for each combination of A and B. So the first regressor is the mean for the cell uh, that's level one of A and level one of B. The second, beta 2, corresponds to level 1 of A, level 2 of B, and so on and so forth. So I will have six regressors. So for this one, um, I'm just expressing, because these um, some of these F tests get a little unwieldy for me to write out the alternative hypothesis, I'm just sticking with the null. So if my null hypothesis is just to test the main factor A effect, um, and this would be an F test, so it'll be a two-sided test. Let's see what that would look like. Okay, so what I'm showing you here are two different ways of uh, looking at this. So a main factor A effect, you could think of it as, um, if there isn't an effect, it means the marginals would be the same. So A1, A2, and A3 would all be equal to each other. So the null is that A1 is equal to A2, equal to A3. Again, we need a zero on the end, so that's equivalent to A1 minus A3 equal to zero, A2 minus A3 equal to zero. So if you run those two comparisons, that is how you test the main factor A effect. So let's see what that looks like in terms of the contrasts. And I guess in terms of uh, this graph, I guess I should relate it to this graph since I have it here. We want to know if A1, so I'm going to have to average together the two levels of B, if that is different from A, sorry, A3 down here, average those together, and if A2 is different from A3. So here's our design matrix again. Oh, I did write the alternative out, uh, mean of A3. A1 minus mean of A3 is not equal to zero. Mean of A2 minus mean of A3 is not equal to zero. So those are the two contrasts I have to set up. Remember, you just set those up and stack them. So A1, to get that by itself, I actually have to combine two betas because two betas are required in order to cover both of the, um, all of the A1 variables. So you can almost pretend, well, no, you can't pretend the Bs aren't there, but you just have to focus on what levels of A each beta corresponds to and make sure you uh, use all those levels. So A1 minus A3 looks like this. I have 1, 1. Those are my two levels of A1. 0, 0 because I don't care about A2 and then negative 1, negative 1. The second row is where I do A3, A2 minus A3. So again, it's a matrix because I'm running an F test. 
Um, so that is the matrix that you would input into the software. Okay, so that's a little hairy. Not horrible, but you kind of have to sit back and think about it for a minute. The interaction effect is even worse. So an interaction, going back, it's easiest to see an interaction in the graph. That's when you're comparing the differences, uh, let's say B1 minus B2, for each level of A. So we want to know if B1 minus B2 for level 1 of A is the same as B1 minus B2 at level 2, and if that's the same as B1 minus B2 for level 3. So no effect would mean the lines would be parallel. So here's what it looks like. A1, B1 minus A2, B2 equal to A2, B1 minus A2, B2 equal to A3, B1 minus A3, B2. So now we need to get a zero, so we need to subtract this from everything. And it ends up, I, I didn't write it out, it's just a mess. But this ends up being what your contrast looks like. This is A1, B1 minus A1, B2. B2, that's this part. So it's A1, B1 minus A2, B2, and then I'm going to subtract from that A3, B1 minus A3, B2. So that ends up being a negative A3, B1 plus A3, B2. So A1, B1 minus A1, B2, negative A3, B1 plus A3, B2. Repeat in the second row, but now using A2, so we get A2B1 minus A2B2, A negative A3B1 plus A3B2. So hopefully you found that confusing because this is my motivation for using the factor effects model. I find this, um, I, I, I'm very wide open to making errors when I'm using this model. So let's just recall the setup. For factor effects, we use this one minus one zero setting. So it's one for the current level you're focusing on, negative one for your baseline. I usually choose the biggest level for that, and then zero otherwise. And you have to figure out how many regressors you'll have for each level. So A has three levels, or for each factor. A has three levels, so I need two regressors. So I'm going to have to go through this rigmarole here to create two regressors for A. B has two levels, so I only need one regressor. And just a little foreshadowing, that regressor is going to look a lot like our regressor from our paired t-test. Okay, got that? And I haven't talked about the interaction yet, and I'll show you how you get the interaction because it's important we also model that. All right, so here's the column of ones. We always start with a column of ones. And then I'm starting with A and following my rule. So first of all, you can see I've chosen A3 as my baseline, so I've already filled in my negative ones in my two regressors for A. The first A regressor has ones for level one of A, zeros for level two of A, negative ones for level three. Second one's gonna be the same thing, except zeros for level one, ones for level two, negative ones for level three. And then we're done with A. So these are the two regressors I would test if I want to test a main A effect in this model. B just has this one. I chose negative one, or I chose level two of B as the um, baseline, so that's negative one. So this one just goes one, one, minus one, minus one, 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 minus one, minus one, so on and so forth. And so I only have one regressor for B because B had two levels. Now, the last two columns are my interaction regressors. And the way you construct those is by multiplying, doing element-wise multiplication of different regressors. So this first one, this first term in the interaction, I created by taking the first column corresponding to A, so this one right here that the cursor's on, and I multiplied it by B. So that gives me this, because I'm taking this one times this one, which gives me a one, go on down here, and this one times this minus one gave me this minus one, and you work your way down and you create the whole thing. The second regressor in the interaction, you may have already guessed, is, is created by taking the second A regressor and multiplying that by B. 
So that's where this comes from. Note, I don't multiply the a's together. That doesn't make sense. We're interacting a with b, so you're only going to multiply one at a time, each regressor corresponding to an a to the b. Okay. So then the main a effect, you just grab the betas, which correspond to the a regressors. So that would be beta 2 and beta 3, and each one is in its own contrast. So this is the contrast matrix. 0, 1, 0, blah, 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 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so this is the main factor A effect. In the interaction effect, you do the same thing, but you grab all the interaction-related betas, which will be beta 5 and beta 6, and construct a contrast that plucks each of those out individually. So it would look like this. Then, of course, if your interaction is significant, you have to run a bunch of separate t-tests to help interpret what's going on. Okay, and then what if you need just the mean for cell A1, B1? So your first patient group, uh, males. Again, you use the trick. D is each row of the design matrix identical for each subject in that cell? Yes then that's your contrast. So my contrast for A1, B1 is 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Likewise, if I wanted uh, A3, B2, it would be 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1, 1. Get it? So you just grab it from the row of the design matrix. All right, hopefully you got all that. Um, and hopefully now you see the motivation for using factor effects. Basically, it's when you want to run hypothesis tests for your traditional ANOVA hypotheses for main effects and interaction effects. And I think especially the interaction effect you're going to want to do. If you're modeling an interaction, you're going to want to test it. Um, do you remember the rules for setting up the factor effects regressors? So hopefully you remember where the ones, minus ones, and zeros go. And also, it's important to remember how the interaction terms are created. Thank you so much. Please join the Facebook group. Here's the link. It's just Mumford Brain Stats um, after groups. And I hope you have a wonderful day.